All right, thank you very much for, uh, for attending today's uh, uh, KCS talk. This is the last one for this semester, okay? And the speaker for today is uh, Dr. Jim, uh, Dr. Jim from, from the University of Cincinnati Computer Science, okay? Um, when people talk, we often omit some common, common sense information, okay? Uh, but we, uh, Michelle, of course, uh, does not know that those kind of common sense information, all right? Therefore, there's a problem, you know, when human being and machine talk, because, you know, human being usually will not, you know, provide those kind of common sense information. Therefore, the machine has to be betrayed with those, you know, common sense information so that, uh, you know, that the conversation can go smooth. But that's the focus of today's talk, Dr. Jones talk, right? Dr. Jones uh, um, is from Dr. Uh, University of Utah, okay, which is very you know, famous for computer graphics during the early days, okay. But still it's a very outstanding university. So let's welcome Dr. Jones for his talk for today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hey everyone, um, I'm very happy to have this opportunity to share with my both of you. Um, thank you for inviting me here. So today I'm going to present uh, how we use complex knowledge uh, from the typical function for natural language processing. So if I say John went to um, the supermarket, uh, the restaurant, and asked what did he do, would you say pump gas? Not likely, right? You wait at me. Definitely not. On watch TV, possible or possibly not. Or you say it would be the correct answer because we know that that's the typical reason why people go to a restaurant. Um, let's give an example. Mary took the cake in the oven. Why? Is it because she wants to decorate the cake? No, doesn't need to do that in the oven, right? Cut the cake? Of course, that's not the answer because she will need a knife instead of oven. Eat the cake? Um, of course not. So, ah, bake the cake, that's the correct answer. So you know that's the answer because we know the function of the oven, right? That's the word. Mm. So this research was motivated by observation that we often omit a lot of information in our daily speaking or writing. However, we humans have no difficulty understanding each other because we have the common sense knowledge that can help us. However, it's difficult for machines to read between the lines as we humans do because they don't have um, this common sense. So here the research goal is to bridge this gap by building computational models that can help enable the, um, the inference about the implicit languages. Here's the outline in this presentation. I'll be covering sorry, um, how to learn this knowledge, um, how to um, store this knowledge in computers, and how to apply them for real world practice. And uh, I'll also be discussing the motivation behind this work and the challenges that we have faced and the um, solutions that we propose to tackle the problem. So first, let's dive into what is this um, functional knowledge and why is it important? So every day people go to different places to accomplish goals, right? Um, people go to bar to drink, go to libraries to study, go to churches to pray. So many locations are associated with one typical reason why people come here. It's also true for physical objects. Like Asian people, um, they create spears for hunting, right? And they need a knife, probably made up from uh, stones, to cut the meat, and they need a container, like a pot, to cook the food. And uh, not to say that humans are very creatious, uh, creative species, um, that probably new objects are being invented every day around the world, and most are creative for a reason. So we refer to most the typical reason why people go to a place or um, the most uh, typical way a physical object is often being used as their prototypical functions. So you might wonder why um, is this uh, um, information important? Uh, I'll give you some examples in um, typical NLP applications. So first one is semantic disambiguation. Consider these two sentences. I need a ladder to reach her. And second one is I need a phone to reach her. Even though these two sentences are very similar, right? Probably the same grammar, but they differ in the objects. So in the first sentence, I need a ladder to reach her, which means um, to move upward in order to touch, right? 
But in the second sentence, which means um, to establish communication with, and also implies this is like a remote communication. So nowadays, intelligent virtual assistants are very popular, um, such as um, Google Voice, Apple Siri. And one important task for these virtual assistants is you have open-ended conversations with um, users. So if a girl says, well, I just went to the beach, and the boy can naturally reply, well, did you go swimming, right, as an appropriate follow-up. So our virtual systems will also need common sense knowledge to have like a similar response. Um, also, I want to show you that um, probably implicitness is more common than you might think. Um, we took the canoe up the river. So took is a very general verb. Sometimes people call it a light verb. Uh, but what did we actually do with the canoe? Did we carry the canoe on our shoulder and walk up the river? No, that's not the case. We all know that, right? We sat on the canoe and rode the canoe up the river. It's used as a vehicle, but it's not explicit in the sentence. Um, she finished the pizza. What did she do with the pizza? She finished eating the pizza. Finish also only means that it's the end of this activity, right? But you finished doing what here? That's the uh, key to understand the sentence. She used the washcloth on the floor. Used is also a very general verb. You can use any tools to do accomplish any goals, right? But actually here means she cleaned the floor. She wiped the floor using the washcloth. This is also implicit here. You stand on the street with a guitar and a crowd will come. Um, I think if you just hold a guitar, right, um, then probably people won't come to you around you because only if you, when you play the guitar, like people will stop by and see you play. Um, so these information are, are all based uh, on our common sense knowledge about the objects used in the sentences. And hopefully by now you're convinced that, well, this prototypal function is one type of important common sense knowledge. And now let's see how can we automatically learn this knowledge um, using our computers. I will introduce two work. One is to learn the functions for the um, locations, and the other one is for um, the objects. Okay, let's start with the locations. So, since our goal is to learn why people go to a place, right, there are two variables here. One is the location, and another one is activity. So to formalize, uh, formalize the task, um, we define it as given a location, the system should uh, tell us what people do, what are the activities happening in this location. And specifically, it should uh, um, be in this form, like people go to libraries to study, go to churches to pray, hospitals to see a doctor, etc. So we start the task from extracting pairs of location and activities from like a large corpus. And uh, we use a personal web block corpus, uh, which contains over a million personal blogs because we thought like uh, when you blog in, um, you, you describe a lot of daily life activities, right? That's what we want. Um, we use two syntactic patterns. Uh, one is go to x to y, and we expect uh, people say, well, x is the uh, location and y is the activity or activity happen in or at x, right? By doing so, we can extract a, a lot of pairs of locations and activities. Like we, go to, we can extract to go to school to study, a Walmart for groceries, but that's not the end of the task. It's not stopped yet because we also extract a lot of like noisy data, like Walmart to get one. That's also plausible, and that's not the wrong answer, but it's just too general and not meaningful for us. But they also can have high frequency, so it's not trivial to just get rid of them. So our next step is to how to um, rank and select the appropriate activities for our locations. And uh, our motivation is that similar act, um, locations should ha have similar activities. For example, like McDonald's and Burger King, they should have like similar um, activities happen there, like eat burger. And to model the task, we build a and uh, each location is represented as a node in this graph. So let's see how, um, how, do, how do we build the graph. It's like for each node, we specifically build a very huge vector um, for each node. And this vector, you can imagine, is like a very huge vector and contains all the possible activities in the universe. Um, and uh, each cell represents one activity, and uh, it is uh, one um, scale from 0 to 1. Um, indicates the probability of this activity being the, uh, the function for this location. 
for example, if um, the, the vector of the McDonald's, there is one element corresponding to eat burger, and it's 0 0.8, means probably uh, that eat burger has, uh, is the, the, the function that for the McDonald's. So how do we represent um, as uh, like uh, to, to for computation is that we got this matrix. Um, is you can see that the rows are the locations and the columns are um, the activities. So if two rows are similar locations like McDonald's and Burger King, then the value for the corresponding activities should be similar. Um, so here is a more concrete example. Um, these uh, numbers are just made for illustration. Um, you can see that McDonald's and Burger King, their eat burger, that column has high value than prey, right? Because you don't typically go to these places for praying. Um, and what else do we need? So now we have the nodes representation, right? So then we also need the address. How do we define what's the, um, the distance from one node to another? So we use a similarity matrix. Sorry, yes. Oh, no, they will be updated. Uh, you mean these values say in the matrix? Dimension of the oh, dimension of the vector. The the dimension of the vector is fixed. fixed. Yeah, yeah. So we extract all the possible activities from the corpus. Yeah, that's like all the um, activities we have extracted. Yeah. For the question. Um, so. Then we build this similarity matrix um, describing how um, locations are similar to each other. So here our learning mode, uh, function is motivated by like similar locations should have similar activities, right? So it's very intuitive. Um, the W is the similarity matrix where two locations are similar. The WIK is like close to one means that there's um, activity vector, the yi and yk, should be similar. So we want to find such uh, uh, active profile matrix that can minimize this sum. So how do we compute it is we use an algorithm called the label propagation, which is somehow supervised learning algorithm. Um, it starts from a small set of seed um, locations that are human labeled, and then it gradually learn the nodes that, are, um, that don't have labels. So in this case, we use um, this uh, model to gradually learn um, the activity um, uh, happen in one location from their neighbors. Um, so here are some examples from the Go data set. So we provide um, the locations to a bunch of human annotators and ask them to provide what are the typical activities happening in this location, and we collect their um, answers. So for the bookstore, people say buy book, browse book, um, browse bestseller. And for pharmacy, there is get drug, fill prescription, get prescription, et cetera. For the market, we have buy grocery, buy fresh, et cetera. And on the right side, I show some um, system output from uh, our algorithm. Like you can see that for the bookstore and the pharmacy, our system performed pretty good. We also say, well, buy book, purchase book, right? Um, buy find medicine, get prescription. Here, I want to mention that um, you should note that it's very difficult um, to compare um, the free text, even though they represent the same thing or same meaning, but you have a million different ways to express them. So evaluation is kind of difficult. Um, but for the market, uh, um, um, obviously there is a polynomial issue that our uh, model says, well, make money. That's the financial market, not the real stores. So, um, this is about the functions of locations. What about physical objects? Um, we know many objects associated with, also associated with one typical reason why people use them. Um, here are some examples like knives are created for cutting, bicycles are for transportation, and the telephones you know, um, are for communication. And the function knowledge is important for objects because um, people generally infer that the objects are used in the most typical way, unless they are told otherwise. And this is not our assumption. This is the um, conclusion from our human annotation. So some examples, I finished the puzzle means I finished the solving the puzzle. Even though you don't need a context, you don't need you know, people to provide extra information to make the inference. I finished a movie. Unless you know that I'm a, a film producer or a director, you the directly assume that I finished watching the movie, right? And uh, just the function of 
physical objects, our first question is, how do we represent them? And here we use a canonical representation um, called frames to represent the functions. So it's a study of how we associate um, um, phrases and words with cognitive structures called frames. Usually it characterize a small scene or abstract uh, situation. And the research on frame semantics uh, has grown within the field of natural language processing and the cognitive science since the uh, 1970s. And in the 1990s, um, the FrameNet, uh, the Berkeley FrameNet project, they released an uh, online lexical um, that, can um, that people can use. And since there are many tasks, they use this FrameNet um, in their work. So here is an example from um, the FrameNet. This frame is called cooking creation. So it has this definition. The frame describes food and meal preparation. So there is a cook who creates the produced food from ingredients. And there are heating instruments or a container that can also happen in this um, situation. And how FrameNet should be used is that whenever um, they also provide a list of so-called um, trigger words or lexicon units, where um, so whenever you see these like verbs, or it could be nouns as well, that can trigger the uh, the meaning of this frame. Like uh, Kathleen baked some cookies from the pre-packaged dough, right? So here you see the baked then you probably um, think about, well, should we apply the cooking creation frame here? Um, then you can f decide, well, Kathleen is the cook, and some cookies is to produce the food, and the prepackaged dough is the ingredients. So the benefits of using FrameNet um, as a representation for the function is that for, um, the multiple reasons. So first one is it has rich semantic structure. It also uh, has semantic roles. It also has like inter-frame relations that we can later use. Um, categorization, so naturally, if we assign one frame to represent the function of multiple objects, then we automatically know that these objects are functions. But if you have like a free text, then probably you need to do some post-processing like, right, to group them together. Um, this is also true for the evaluation as I just showed in previous work that it's really hard to evaluate uh, like free text, a human language, to compare if it actually mean the same thing. And the versatility is many work, they also use FrameNet, and uh, our work can be then be um, relatively easy to inject to help other um, tasks as well. And uh, so th now the task becomes how to find the frame that represents the function, right? This is in nature similar to a task called a so-called frame identification. Um, so frame, um, this is a, a part of the standard frame semantic parsing task. So um, what we do is we given a task and the trigger word, we want to find what is the most appropriate frame that represents the meaning here. So here the example sentence is that the pandemic has sparked a lot of problems for the economy. So spark is uh, related to two meanings in FrameNet. One is provide a stimulus for, um, and the corresponding frame is cause to start. And the, the other one um, is to ignite, right? And the associated frame is setting fire. So obviously the the answer is the first one. Um, to solve this task, we build a transformer-based model um, that take advantage of the definition of the frames and their lexical units. And this simple idea worked surprisingly well. It achieved the state of the art on this um, task. So I'm not going into the details here in terms uh, with respect to time, but feel free to check our paper if you're interested. So this system later will become part of the model to learn about protocol function. Um, but being able to recognize the frame does not automatically solve the problem because they rely on a lot of context. But now we only have objects, right? And we want to find the functions for these objects. So where do these contexts come from? Um, but we are only a few steps away. So first, not all frames in FrameNet are more useful to represent the function. So we do a manually filter and try to select a set of frames that can be used to describe the function of the um, objects. Um, and uh, so some examples like a hat, um, shirt, their function is to wear, right? The basket and luggage, they're containers. The bicycle, yacht, they're transportation vehicles, so they're for self-motion. Armor, helmet, that's for protecting yourself. Uh, knife, scissors, they're for cutting, um, and so many other um, examples. So here our goal is to, given one object, we should have an intelligent system that assign one frame to tell us, well, what's the function of this object? 
So our first approach was motivated by the observation um, that dictionaries, usually they provide a short and precise description of what this object is and what is, sometimes they also include what this object is used for. Like for the knife here, a dictionary definition says it's an edge tool used as a cutting instrument. Well, that's good. Uh, cutting is like explicit here. And on the other hand, the cutting frame in FrameNet, they also have a um, de uh, definition. So we're thinking if we can compare these two sentences and decide that if they have a match. Um, so what we do is that for every, um, you give me one object and I'll find every pair of the, uh, the frames with that and use a model to decide which one has the highest probability. And uh, there are some technical terms here. I'll just uh, give you a brief introduction to the background techniques. So these days NLP models, they rely on this uh, pre-trained fine-tuned paradigm where first uh, there is a language model that is pre-trained uh, unsupervisedly on a massive amount of data like a web data or um, like books. Um, and the, the model is very complicated, but to, to give you a high level idea, it's just to, to uh, train it to mimic, you know, um, to generate plausible human language. And then um, on a specific downstream task, like task classification, question answering, or summarization, um, the, we, we have a small set of Go data, and then we fine tune the model on this data set to achieve better performance. So one of the most uh, popular language models is BERT, and it has architecture called a transformer. And probably the most important thing to remember about the transformer is that it use uh, architecture, uh, use a mechanism called a tension, self which can put weights on different parts of the input sentence. Um, so go back to our problem is now we want to use a definition um, to help select which frame right is the most probable function. Then we pair them. So as shown in like each green box, like uh, we feed the pair of definition from the for the object and the definition for the frame as one sequence, okay? And then compute their semantic similarity, and then we have a linear layer to predict. Well, so here the um, we, the, the example is a knife, right? Uh, we have knife edge tool, and uh, we have the cutting frames. We have every possible frame, so like cooking creation. And uh, we, we hope that our model can tell us, well, knife and cutting frame, they have the highest probability, right? So that our model predicts cutting is the correct answer here. And the second approach we um, use is uh, using a mask language model. So mask language models are trained by, you know, randomly mask a few tokens in the sentence and ask the model to predict uh, what are the mask ones? So like uh, it's kind of like a filling the blank test. Um, like knife can be used to blank, right? And we hope that the model can tell us, well, that last token should be cut. And uh, to use this mask language model, we build the, some multiple templates. We say, well, knife can be used to do what? Or knife can be used for what? Or the purpose of knife is to what? And feed all these uh, manual templates into model and ask that to provide um, the answer. And uh, specifically what we do is we use the last hidden states from for these like mask token and then get an average of that also feed them into the linear model to, for prediction. And uh, hopefully um, and uh, we also do uh, uh, combine the models together for joint learning. So we compare our models with multiple baselines. So ConceptNet is a very widely used uh, uh, knowledge base. Um, the, it has low uh, performance because the coverage issue um, and many objects they do not cover in the data set. And uh, to overcome that, a commit um, is also a transform model that is trained on the ConceptNet, um, but they can generate the content that are not in the ConceptNet. Um, and we show that using the mask uh, model that uh, we already outperformed the previous baselines and uh, adding the definition, uh, is we have a great boost. But, and then by combining together, we have uh, also a little improvement over that. So I have introduced uh, how we um, learn the knowledge and can we expect the problem of inferencing about the implicit uh, language being solved? Or more specifically, can we say that whenever we see an object in a sentence, um, we should just apply the function? Probably it's not wise to do so, because a big problem for applying this functional knowledge is that oftentimes, or sometimes, when a sentence mentions an object, 
the, it's possible that the object is not used at all. So in this case, um, we shouldn't uh, um, imply the function of this knowledge. So he put a knife in the dishwasher, right? There is no implic uh, explicit knife or implied use. Um, the knife fell off the table, also you didn't like use the knife at all, right? Um, on the other hand, it's also possible that when a sentence mentions an object, it only implies that this object will be used in the future. It's not, it has not been used um, though, like she got a knife from the drawer, right? um, or she asked John for a knife. There is an explicit intention of using this knife, um, although um, it has not been used yet. So to tackle the problem, we created a, a new NLP task um, called the Object Use Classification, which classified the usage status of an object in the sentence into three categories. Um, Specifically, we define um, use the category and future use and no use. Um, here I show some examples from our human annotated data set. So first for the use case, we took a speedboat up the river to the village. Obviously, we have already like used this speedboat, right? Um, he walked over to his mattress and laid down. Um, he used his mattress. Um, anticipated use, I went to the garage and got more boxes. So you want to use the boxes, that's why you go to the garage and retrieve them, right? I got measured for my tuxedo for the wedding next month. You need to wear the tuxedo for the wedding next month, so that's why you get it done. Um, and for the no use case, well, no plates also hit my left headlight and broke it, where I promptly threw the brochure in the corner, probably to collect dust, right? Um, there is no intention to use the, these items and also I didn't like use them, probably. So how to tackle this problem, we have like two observations. So one is that from our annotation, we find whenever an object um, is, did has like the implication of the use or future use, then the majority of time, like 90% of the time, that the object is used as its most typical way. So for example, you can use a knife for raising the monitor or any other use, right, rare use, but 90% of the time when you mention the book, Actually, you implied that uh, that's for reading, um, which inspired us to use the functional knowledge to help identify the usage status. So, for the um, because of pri uh, in prior work we already introduced how we can represent the function of the objects using FrameNet and the FrameNet they have for each uh, frames they have a lot of example sentences. Then we take advantage of this to analyze, to see if we can find any patterns in these sentences and see if they are similar to the ones that uh, we are trying, currently trying to um, solve. And uh, the other observation comes from um, the distribution of the, two lab uh, the three labels. So even though we randomly sample these sentences uh, from a text corpus, uh, however, after the annotation, we find that the use case is double the size of future use and no use. So we use a, a technique called data augmentation to augment the um, future use and no use case to make them uniform. Um, so uh, the, um, the, sorry. the data augmentation is a technique that uh, creates or improves the data, on the existing data, without a more human effort. Um, a typical technique include uh, uh, edit existing data set or generate um, like synthetic data from scratch. Uh, like a common uh, ways of doing that include the um, back translation. Um, what it means that you have one sentence, like in English, for example, I have no time. Then you have automatic uh, machine translator that you translate this um, uh, sentence from one language to another and then translate back. So you have kind of like a paraphrase of this sentence. And you know, so in this way, we can have more diversity of the original data set. Um, okay, so how we build the model uh, has two main modules, as I just introduced before. So one is the augmentation part, where we have more data, and then the other part is we take advantage of the example sentences in FrameNet. Um, let's start uh, from the beginning. Is first, so I, this suppose we have sentence, I lay on the bed. So the bed here is the object, and then we find that it's synonyms um, from a word net, it's a dictionary. So then we have sentences like, I lay on the couch, I lay on the bunk. So they have almost the same meaning, but the different uh, uh, words. 
And then we feed them into a neural translator to do the back translation in order to get sentences like, I rested on the bed, I sit on the couch, I lay in the bunk. So we also here expect that it has very similar meanings, but different ways. Um, so on the other hand, um, from our prior uh, the database, we know that the object bed, the function for that is sleep. So we locate this frame in FrameNet. Well, the sleep frame in FrameNet, they have a lot of exemplar sentences. And we also extract them to compare with the original sentences we extracted, and also after the augmentation. And then we compare them together to um, fit into a transformer for classification into one of the three labels. So we compare this model with uh, multiple previous methods. Um, so here I only show the best one. So T0++ is a a uh, model that has been trained on multiple um, tasks and has achieved this state of the art, you know, very good performance on, on them. So we thought it should be a, like a strong baseline. And we see that our base model, um, that without the data augmentation and without um, the frame, uh, outperforms this model. But when adding the, uh, the example sentences and augment, uh, as shown in the ablation study, that we can see that our model can further improve. And finally, when combining these together, our model can still like get a little bit, a little bit better. Um, so furthermore, I want to show you how the multiple functions can help um, understand the implicit language as using FrameNet uh, in the standard the frame semantic parsing way. So the sentence is like, I grabbed my binoculars, but the coyote has run away. So the FrameNet, like, they focus on the explicit predicate. So here it's grab. So you don't know this is like a manipulation event, right? But that's not the key to understand the sentence. Actually, you have to understand the function of the binoc binoculars in order to understand why you need this um, binocular and uh, because you want to watch this coyote, right, from a long distance. Um, you stand on the street with a guitar and the crowd will come again. So stand here only means the pasture, all right? Um, doesn't tell you that actually you should play or um, Otherwise, the people won't stop by and watch you. Uh, and she had this spunky uh, outfit, uh, complete in armor, backpack, and a skirt. So head here only means the position, right? Um, the frame semantic parser will attack that, uh, will attack that as a position event, probably. But here, you need to know that the outfit is for wearing um, to understand the sentence. So, so far, we have introduced how to learn the knowledge of functions and uh, um, how, when to use them in uh, textual understanding. And then in the last part, to introduce an application of using this common sense knowledge uh, for a visual task. So consider um, this image. Can you guess what's happening? So we all know that a million things can happen with the little ones. Um, however, you may not realize that um, you didn't see a series of continuous action, right? Already you know this is, just a, this is a baby eating something. Even if you didn't see that the whole event, well, you just see the baby is making a grimace, there's some green, green food left over, um, but you did see like a spoon um, and a hand holding the spoon in front of the baby's mouth. So how we make the inference, so we want to make the assumption that because we know the function of the spoon, that can help um, the model to identify, well, this is eating or feeding event. So here we use a task called uh, situation recognition um, for illustration. So situation recognition is a task um, that uh, we try to recognize um, the activity that happened in one image and also predict the people and the, the other participants. We also use FrameNet as a representation. So here are some um, examples from the data set. So the first one, the two people sat on the canoe and uh, so they're in a like motion event. And second one, see a bunch of policemen uh, holding the, the shells, wearing a helmet, standing in front of a wall, um, right? Um, that's protecting. And the last one, you see uh, people is like cutting the onions using a knife. So based on our understanding of the object, we should infer, well, because canoe is for motion, or shield is for protecting, or knife is for cutting, right? So actually, um, you can make other inferences if you, even though you don't, uh, you have the, the knowledge for that. Because, for example, like the, the knife cutting the onion one, because you don't see a continuous action, you can infer, well, the knife, um, the, the onions has already been cut, and you just put the knife, like, in the middle, 
right? But normally you would not assume that, right? So in spite of our assumption, um, we want to design a model that can take three sources of input, um, the image, um, the object, the end the object knowledge. So previously, typical uh, way of doing this is they train the image encoder on this data set and try to predict the possible activities. They solely rely on the image features. But here we want to get more information to help make a better decision. Specifically, um, first, uh, after we have this image, we have an automatic object detector that can help us identify what are the objects um, in this image. And then from our prior knowledge base, we know that um, if we can identify what are the, uh, the functions for this, uh, the objects that exist in these images, and then we combine these together to see if that the function of the objects happening in this image can help identify what are the main activities. That's the motivation. And then we combine these three sources of information together into a transformer encoder and for classification. So let's tease them apart. So first, um, we have a image encoder. That's a standard way um, to encode the features from this image into a vector. And then we have an automatic uh, object detector to say, well, what's in this image? So we see like a cookie sheet, uh, the tray. There is an oven on the behind, the, right, the desk. Um, so we think out probably there are like a cooking happening, right? And uh, from the uh, from these objects, we try to locate what are the functions, right? Um, so for the oven, we know there's cooking creation, and probably there's some other uh, functions. And then we have like, text encoder to encode all this information into uh, two other vectors. And then finally, we combine these three sources together to form um, like one com uh, representation into the encoder for uh, classification. So this task is not trivial. So actually, there are more than 500 different objects. So it's quite difficult sometimes to select the most appropriate verb uh, representing the function. So here, we want the model to say, well, this is a baking event. So we evaluate the model on the standard data set um, using the original split. And then we compare the model with multiple previous uh, methods. And here, I only show the best one. We see that um, using our, the, the ARF model is the, we only use the image feature. We already see that it uh, outperforms the previous method a little bit. But then by adding what objects exist in this image, we can have a better performance. But here, I also want to mention that uh, there is still a large room for improvement because if you use the code annotated objects in this image, the true objects that are provided by human, then we have a huge boost from like using automatic uh, object detector. Um, it's also worth uh, mentioning that sometimes the image has objects that are not in our data set. So in order to understand uh, the true influence of the functional knowledge, we compare, uh, we, we split the, the test into two sets. So one set is the objects that has the objects with our, in our uh, the database, and the other one has the objects that are not in our database. And we see that um, the right column shows that when there, there is object in our data set, when applying this functional knowledge, we have five points uh, gain from without this knowledge. Okay. To summarize, um, so we have shown that we can automatically learn common sense knowledge for the function, for the objects, and for the locations. And uh, they are useful for um, like textual understanding, and they can be helpful for uh, uh, computer vision as well. So for some feature directions, so first uh, using uh, symbolic representation sometimes can uh, be, um, is not perfect. So some functions when we do the experiment we realize that you cannot find one frame in FrameNet that represents this specific function. So probably we need a better way to automatically you know, augment the FrameNet or find better frames. And also current FrameNet data set the, for the frame semantic parsing um, um, it focuses more on the explicit uh, meaning, the predicate or nouns in the sentence. But we need more effort in understanding the implicitness of the um, behind. And uh, also, in order to show any improvement we can do uh, for the implicit uh, understanding, we need better ben uh, benchmarks. So currently, there are a lot of you know, data sets in NLP, um, like question answering, or, uh, language inference. But usually, they require a comprehensive language understanding skills, not one 
uh, not to one specific one. So we need uh, like more specific data sets that target um, probably one common sense knowledge or uh, specific types. And this work is also related to uh, the long tail problem. So like um, many common sense knowledge because they are not written down in textbook or in a dictionary. So learn how to learn this um, is still like a challenging problem. And as I mentioned before, um, our proposed book for identifying the object use, um, they still focus on the, the most typical way the object is being used, right? That like covers 90%. You might think, well, 90% is very high, but actually there's still like 10% left where the use, where rare use case that our system cannot handle. Um, this is also true for computer vision. So like the object detector, they can do very well on the data set because they have already seen objects, but there are so many objects that has not seen it or it's not in the data set or it does not have enough examples uh, describing those active, uh, the objects in the data set, then it doesn't to perform very well on an unseen one. And then lastly, I believe uh, the multi-modality will become a very important part in, in AI. Um, so for example, um, psychologists have shown that by four or five months old, like a human baby, reason about like a physical movement um, in some degree. But uh, then the, uh, on the comparison, for the comparison, our models cannot. So uh, incorporating this um, common sense knowledge about the objects or about uh, some other stuff will help the computer vision task as well. Um, okay, that's all for my presentation. Thank you so much. We have uh, quite a few minutes for questions. So if you have a question, raise your hand. I'll give you the mic. I'm just curious. Yeah. Used an example in there. I took the canoe up the river, mm -hmm. which could have multiple meanings depending on the context. Something that's unique to English. Do you have that same problem with other languages? Oh, that's a good question. I, I, I bet so, but uh, yeah. So I only like have studied like English version of this, but uh, I bet in other languages there, there must be some because of languages, you know naturally developed a language, not like a programming languages. They have a lot of ambiguity in the languages. Yeah, every language have this kind of phenomenon. Yeah, very much related to that. I wanted to know if you've heard of any uh, research being done into other languages, like similar to what you're doing, but studying how other languages use these objects. Um, I'm not sure, like in other languages. So. Yeah, the specific Maybe that's phenomenon. the future then, right? Yeah. yeah, 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 but that's a very promising future work. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the very nice talk. So uh, the data set that uh, you have, this uh, common sense thing, so essentially you collected a corpus and then you assembled that. Yes. And all these large language models, maybe they have also read the, the same text. So mm -hmm. I am wondering, yeah. uh, can prompt engineering or chain of thought prompting, can already do the thing that you are doing? Yeah, exactly. That's a very good question. That's what I'm planning to do right now. Because this work has been done like before this ChatGPT thing, large language model. Even though there, we use the, the large language techniques, but at that time, like, uh, the language model is not as intelligent as like this, uh, like 20, uh, 200 billion, these very large models. So at that time, the ability to generate these languages from corpus is not that strong. But, but I'm eager to see, well, if like nowadays these larger models or more intelligent models, they can provide better uh, results. Um, yeah, but, but uh, um, definitely there's still like a long tail problem, like uh, really seeing objects or like even new objects being invented, right? The, if that model has not been seen, I don't know if they have this generalization ability to generate what's the possible you know, uh, result. But as a human, well, if you know this object has some similarity to another, like as our model, that's why the motivation behind this model, right? So if we know that this, uh, if someone today invented a thing and we know um, it has similarity to another one, probably we can have a guess, an educated guess.
Yeah, um, yeah. So th that's why I was also referring to chain of thought prompting because essentially a lot of uh, things, if we just engineer the prompt in a way, chain of thought prompting, I, oh, I believe you are I see, I see what that. you mean. You this can tell the model about this. This, this object is similar to another yes, one. do it step by step. So you, like you are adding that's a good some, idea. some stuff. Uh, uh, so these are the objects, so these objects are used for this thing, and then y you showed the improvement. So I'm just uh, wondering, you could just do uh, chain of thought prompting over there, and then just run everything through your model, it, it might further improve. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. very possible. <laughs> Thank you. And Dr. Uh, Dr. Stekin works in a similar or related area. So that's why he can. Yeah, we should have more discussion yeah, offline. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, talk so to him after the, you know. Yeah, if you are available, we, I yeah, yeah, yeah. come yeah. to you. So I, I have another question. That is at the very beginning, maybe slide 17 or 16. So when you showed, so these are the objects, these are the activities. So you created that sparse matrix manually, or how, how, how did you oh, do oh, that? Oh. Uh, location where uh, the object. Uh, this one? S no. uh, se I think it was 17 or something. 17. Seven. Slide 1 7. Slide 17, yeah. Oh, this one? Uh, yeah, th th this is, yes. So, so the activities are here, the places are there. Yeah. So you did this or you just showed no, no. it? So we have a small set of locations that we provide to human annotators and ask them. So, so some of the, uh, um, then we you know, um, transfer them into like a vector. But for most of these rows, they are like randomized at first. And then we hope the model can gradually update to this matrix when they learn, well, some, uh, some locations are close each to, to, to each other. Yeah, I, I was curious about the, the columns. Yeah. So the, the, the columns are fixed? Um, oh, you mean the columns? Yes. Yeah. yeah. The, the, the dimension of the, the dimension is fixed. Yes. That's from the other possible activities we already extracted so from the large corpus. Uh, if you remember what was from the top of your head, what was that? Like 6,000, 20,000? Oh, OK. The, I don't have a, I don't remember because exactly. Uh, but I mean, it's really it'll long. It will be a huge. No, it's very not a thousand. It's uh, probably hundreds of thousands. Hundreds of thousands, yeah. so it's like huge. Very huge. And this is part a very as huge. well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So most of them probably are zero, close to zero. Okay. So, yeah, I see there. Maybe there could be something done here to convert this sparse into maybe dense or maybe more compact representations. Uh, yes, that's why actually for the second work we only focus on you know using a frame as a representation because we realize this sparse matrix has a problem. And sometimes, you know, they have multiple columns, probably actually they mean the same thing. They should be grouped together. But there isn't really no intelligent way to do that. So if we can have like a canonical representation, then we can um, sm uh, get to reduce the dimension. Yeah. Thank you. Question, how sparse is the matrix? Uh, it's really sparse. I don't know Where what's the sparse? metric to, to, to evaluate that. But uh, most of these, the columns are zero. Yeah, because this is like hundreds of thousands of the, the lens. So D is very large. Yeah, yeah. Very large. And only for like, a, um, like one location, probably only like 10 typical things you do there, right? So, yeah. So you train your machine using very large? Uh, yeah, so the, the label propagation, the best thing is that um, we, we just, uh, we don't uh, update the parameters. We don't, you know, get to the... Uh, the minimum, uh, the local minimum or global minimum. Uh, it's just uh, like a um, one way. Um, it's fair, uh, the computation will converge after um, several iterations. Mm -hmm. So the computation time is not that large. Yeah. Right. We still have some time. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I think this very in, in interesting talk because I'm not expert in this field. I have one kind of a, a feeling that what if the implicitness they have. Can you, uh, oh, yeah, turn it on. Uh, what about now? Yeah. 
Yeah, that I have a very uh, naive feeling that what if the implicit knowledge you gather has some kind of a uh, bias, the human origin of ori origin of bias. So mm. does that affect your uh, performance or? Did you get the question? Uh, yes, yes. Or so bias. Um, this is a good question. So for this purpose, I don't think there is much bias because it's you know most of functions, but there did uh, has an influence on our prediction. Uh, not because of the bias, it's because we bias towards the, the most common thing. So like real stuff probably will never predict, but that did happen. Like you reuse a book to you know, raise a monitor stuff, then our model is not able to handle that. Yeah. So if you were using um, annotations that you ask the Amtur workers or whomever to yeah, do, we use Amazon you can Turk. probably yeah. avoid bias. But once you release, once you start getting data from the wild, you're going to get all sorts of bias based on who posts and what sort of things get posted and don't get posted. Um, I mean, for instance, mm. there's probably more pornographic use of objects on the web than in reality, just a guess. Um, that's going to bias things in some weird ways. Um, people who can afford the leisure time and the equipment are more likely to post. Yeah, yeah. You're going to get national language, specifically language biases. You will get biases. Um, but I believe that the ones you set up, maybe not. <laughs> oh, thank you so much for adding this information. I really didn't have much thought on that, yeah. All right, if you have no more questions, then we thank, uh, uh, we thank the speaker for his very exciting talk today. Thank you so much again.